Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I love Canada. Everyone is so positive all the time. It's like anytime you ask someone something, like, can we something something? They're like, yes, we can. Uh, duh. <laughs> so I'm Ramya. Nice to meet you all. I'm a user experience architect at Cardinal Solutions. Cardinal Solutions is a company that makes software solutions for various applications. But before we actually start making anything, we kind of have to figure out what the heck are we making? So that's my job. That's what user architect, uh, user experience architect refers to. So that's what I sometimes call my uh, money job or my day job. And I have this other kind of passion job. I run this group called Charlotte Storytellers that hosts storytelling uh, workshops and meetings and showcases uh, every, we, ha we have workshops once a week and then we have a showcase every few months or so and it kind of brings out the storytelling community in the city. Can everyone hear me okay or is this wire tapping against, uh, hear me good, okay, cool. Um, and then I'm also on Twitter as Rams Mahalingam and on OpenChair, so hit me up in the social meds. I want more friends. So we're here today to talk about cultural relativism. And cultural relativism sounds like a very fancy term. It sounds kind of academic. But basically, it's the reason why companies like Best Buy and Walmart have failed to move overseas and really failed to, to grow their efforts into these emerging markets. But really, my first experience with cultural relativism happened when I was a freshman in college. I'd grown up in Dubai in the UAE, and I moved to Providence, Rhode Island to go to school. And everything was different. I was in this dorm. It was a, your classic freshman college experience. And I come home one day in the first month, and all my roommates are outside their doors, super excited. They're like really pumped about something. Oh no, that's, it's intentional. It's slides supposed to be blank, sorry. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> sorry, you guys are like really stressed out. I was like, wait, what's going on? <laughs> my bad, my bad. I'll warn you next time. So anyway, so I get home from, um, from my classes or whatever, and all my roommates are outside their doors. They're super excited. They're super juiced about something. And it turns out what they're really excited about is that there's a new Chipotle that just opened down the street. And because college students are hungry and poor, this is like amazing, you know, developments going on in Providence, Rhode Island. So um, Chipotle to me is a brand new concept. I'd grown up in Dubai, which is pretty far from Mexico. It's pretty much the other side of the world. So the concept of cheap Mexican food was a complete mystery to me. Because most of the time that I'd eaten Mexican food back home, I'd eaten it in a place that looked like this, a very kind of fancy experience with like uh, fine dining, there were waiters, you know, like tablecloths. It was, it was a nice food experience. Every time you went out for Mexican food, it was, it was like a treat. Um, because Mexican food was a rare rarity. So when they said cheap Mexican dinner, I was like, yeah, sign me up, let's go. So we all get out uh, of the building and we walk down to the street and we walk all the way uh, to the Chipotle. And as we're getting closer and closer, I'm starting to see there are tons of people congregating here. There's a line out the door wrapping around the block and we get in line and I start to, I start to wonder whether my experience of Chipotle is gonna be quite like what I'm expecting. I'm starting to get the sense that maybe I'm in for something different. And the closer we get to the door, um, the more and more this feeling of, I'm not really sure what's going on, mounts. And we step inside and it's chaos. There are people everywhere. It's really noisy. There's all the stuff you're supposed to do. I get, I, I'm trying to figure out what the protocol is, what's supposed to happen. And before I, I can really figure it out, it's my turn. I'm next. And I'm standing behind the screen and someone behind is like asking me if I want a bowl or rice or tortillas or whatever. And I'm overwhelmed and confused. And somehow I make it through the experience and I emerge with this big foil wrapped package that weighs like the weight of a small baby. And the whole crew Goes, goes back to one of the uh, common areas on the campus and I sit down next to my roommate Steve and uh, I unwrap this package and it looks delicious and it smells awesome. But I don't really have a point of entry. I'm not really sure how to get at this. 
So I, I start, you know, I just kind of go for it, and pretty soon there's a burrito explosion in front of me. And Steve looks over and goes, oh, no, we totally forgot to explain Chipotle to you. So clearly, my hallmates are not very good UX people. I'm pretty sure my experience of Chipotle would have failed most usability testing sessions. But I got better. I went back a few times, and I uh, learned all the Chipotle hacks. You can get tortilla on the side, and guac is free if you're a vegetarian. But for me to get to a point where I felt comfortable going to Chipotle, where it felt like a natural, normal experience, I had to rethink a lot of the constructs in my head. I had to rethink, oops, I'm gonna take this down because I think it's causing a lot of background noise. So I had to rethink a lot of the constructs in my head. I had to rethink my concept of Mexican food. I had to rethink my concept of cheap dinners. I had to come up with a whole new mental, mental construct for Chipotle. What I was experiencing was cultural relativism. Cultural relativism is the understanding that a person's activities and behaviors have to be interpreted in the context of their own culture. It's kind of an old idea. It's from uh, the 1920s. It was talked about by this guy, Frank Boas. He's sort of the, the father of, uh, regarded as a father of anthropology in uh, the US. He started an anthropology program in Colombia and he, he kind of talked about this idea, and a lot of his students kind of wrote about it, and they did a bunch of research around this notion of cultural relativism. But even though this idea has been around since the 1920s, it hasn't really made it into the mainstream. And that's demonstrated by all of these efforts by companies that have tried to take their products and tried to take their markets and what they do and branch out into another market, and have failed in a pretty spectacular way. I'm going to talk through some of these examples, starting from the top left. So Best Buy tried to open a bunch of stores in Europe, and they went at it in typical Best Buy fashion. Giant box stores where you could walk in and find any kind of technology you could ever want, you know, huge, immense options. And they found, they, they went in with a $318 million effort, they built all these stores, and they found that they weren't getting any traffic. No one was actually going to any of these Best Buy stores. It turned out that European customers actually much preferred to go to smaller stores that were a lot more conveniently located. And they didn't want every choice in the world. They just wanted the convenience of being able to go where, where um, they knew the products that they wanted would be. eBay uh, tried to launch their platform in China, and their competitor, Taobao, had a similar, similar service. So the way you build trust with eBay's um, sellers is that you can look at the ratings and reviews and see if other people have approved this seller, if other people have had good experiences. What Taobao had was a chat app where you could get in contact with the person uh, who's selling you the item and talk directly to them to build a relationship and form trust. So eBay actually failed to capture a large percent of the market share because People, they found that people found Taobao much more trustworthy because they had this much more direct contact relationship. Google has infamously had lots of problems uh, in foreign markets, most, most specifically in the Chinese markets. And there's a Google executive, Li Kai-Fu, who's talked about how Google's bureaucracy has prevented um, Google employees and engineers from actually getting into the ground and talking to the local people there. So when they move into these markets, they don't actually have a good idea of, of what people are doing in those regions. Mattel tried to build this giant multi-million dollar um, Barbie extravaganza in Shanghai. It was uh, like 30 stories high and had this giant staircase with 6,000 Barbies on the wall. There was a spa. There was all this stuff that was Barbie oriented. But they had to close it down after just a couple of years because they found that no one actually wanted Barbies. For some reason, parents didn't want to buy Barbies for their children. McDonald's tried to branch out into the Caribbean, um, but they found that a lot of the, the local bonds where they tried to branch out didn't actually enjoy the food. There was an interview with someone who said, um, McDonald's food is bland. We like spicy, tasty food. It's not healthy. It's just not good. Everyone's favorite 
local artisanal coffee shop, Starbucks, tried to branch out their operations into Australia and in Israel. But they found that no one actually wanted to, to go to Starbucks because they did much prefer the local artisanal coffee shops. And the, the taste of the beans that Starbucks made just didn't cater to the local taste at all. Walmart tried to branch out with their everyday low prices um, strategy when they acquired a company in um, Japan. So this company was called Seiyu, and they had a very similar approach as Walmart. You could go in, and it was a, a multi um, kind of a store where you could buy a lot of different things in a lot of different categories. And so Walmart acquired a large number of shares in Seiyu and tried to push this everyday low prices strategy. But it didn't quite work in the same way. In fact, it, it actually made people stop wanting to come to the stores. Apparently, a lot of people thought that the concept of advertising heavily or aggressively pushing low prices was actually related to a concept of cheap quality. And so it made people a lot more suspicious of the quality of the products at this company, Seiyu. And then finally, a success story. A story. WhatsApp was acquired by Facebook a few years ago for $19 billion. And it's one of the few platforms that's really tapped into emerging markets like Brazil and uh, South Asia. I think, I think a key reason for this is it taps into this really amazing ability where you have a single platform across lots of devices where a grandmother can keep in contact with potentially a grandchild on another totally different side of the world. It's just, it's a really easy product that really addresses what people wanted to do in those markets. So, all of these companies that have tried to take these efforts and bring them to another market, a lot of what they ran into is a lot like my Chipotle experience. At the root of all of these examples is a failure to identify a behavior in its own cultural context, a failure to identify what a person is doing in the context of their own cultural influences. So as good UXers and front-enders, design folks, when we hear about things like this, when we hear about problems, we think the answer is actually kind of simple, right? Just do some user research. You're having some problems. Go out, talk to your people, and figure out what they're doing so you can solve it. So I've got a story about that. A few months ago, I was doing a project for a fairly low-end retail client. So this was a, a budget-type store where you would go in um, and find extremely cheap items that were not super high quality. Um, and this company approached us and they wanted to build an app that was focused on discounts. So you'd be able to get this app, clip a bunch of coupons, and then apply those coupons to your purchases. So I, as a UX architect on this project, was tasked with going out and figuring out whether the product we were making was really on point with what people wanted. So I went out to the stores a lot of times. I'd go every Tuesday and Thursday, and I'd stand at the front of the store with a stack of gift cards and as people walked in the door, I'd smile at them brightly and say, hey, would you like to talk to me for a few minutes for a $5 gift card? It was a very transactional approach. Most people came in and would see me smiling and quickly avert their eyes. But the few people who did engage were, were great to talk to, and I got a lot of feedback. So one day, I went out, and I was looking at the notifications and settings part of the app. And so I started talking to this woman, she comes in, um, she seems to be able to use most of the app pretty well, like she gets the idea of coupons pretty quickly, she's able to clip, all the stuff is going great. So I go to the meat of the test. I ask, where might you go to change the kinds of notifications you get from the store? So she goes, notifications? No, nah, I wouldn't do that from in here. I do that from the settings app on my phone. It's where I keep all my bitches. Man, I got so many bitches. Huh? What? I stood there wondering what just happened. This was way off script. Nowhere in any of our usability testing talks did we ever talk about bitches in settings. I didn't have a protocol for what to do. I was out there doing research, talking to this woman, trying to figure out what was going on, 
And I'd come to a complete standstill. I didn't know what was going on. Somewhere in the whole mix of variables, this store, this app, the concept of coupons, the concept of settings, in this woman's mind, all of these variables were spitting out something that was super different from what I was arriving at with all of these variables in my mind. I just didn't know what to do. And you can imagine if all of these companies went out to talk to these customers in these places, they might arrive at a very similar standstill. What do you do when the person in front of you says something you just don't understand? So here's a root of what was going on. I was trying to understand this woman's actions and words and behaviors in the context of my own culture. I wasn't taking a culturally relative perspective. And the academic term for that is ethnocentric. I was taking an ethnocentric perspective. I was trying to project all of my experiences and my concepts of settings, the store, coupons, onto her actions and her behaviors. Several instances like this happened over the course of this project. This was by far the most egregious. But there were a lot of times when someone would say something or do something, and it left me a little confused. I wasn't quite sure what they were talking about. But I didn't really have a protocol for figuring out how to, how to unpack that. And so those things just sort of slipped by. That understanding just passed me by. So even though I was doing usability testing, even though I was doing user research, I was still coming to this large gap between me and the end user, this gap that I didn't know how to bridge. And it left me kind of scratching my head and wondering what was going on. So the core of this problem is that when we go out and do, do user research, a lot of times we take this ethnocentric perspective, and it leaves us with this gap between ourselves and the people we're trying to talk to. We're not taking a culturally relative perspective a lot of the times. And to step back and understand why that is and how to take a more culturally relative perspective, we first need to dig into the idea of culture in general. What is culture? What does it mean to have culture? And again, another good place to turn is anthropology. So a famous cultural anthropologist, James Bradley, has defined culture as the acquired knowledge people use to interpret experience and generate behavior. So the nuance here is really important. Culture is not behavior itself. It's the experiences that generate behavior. So for example, chewing with your mouth closed or chewing with your mouth open. The behavior itself is not culture. It's all of the things that have happened in your life that inform you that chewing with your mouth closed is polite and that chewing with your mouth open is impolite. I kind of think about it as these little bits that surround us. There are all these experiences that we've had in our lives that have formed our worldviews and put us in these positions where we react to the world in certain ways. And all of these little bits around us that's culture. All of the stuff that's happened to generate the way we generate our behaviors, all of that is culture. And everyone here has had a totally different set of life experiences and things that they've been through. So everyone here has their own really individual personal culture. All of the things that have made you who you are and made you react to things the way you do, those become your culture. And it's not really a static thing. It's, it's adaptive. Those things are constantly changing. Let's say you, you grew up thinking that chewing with your mouth closed is polite because you got all of these influences that informed you that way. But let's say you then move somewhere else and you find yourself amongst a group of people who all chew with their mouths open. You may start to switch your perspective. You may start to think that chewing with your mouth open is now the polite thing to do. Or maybe you go back and forth between these two groups and with one context you chew with your mouth closed and the other you chew with your mouth open. Code switching between the two. All of that becomes culture. It's all the stuff that you're interpreting from the world around you and taking in to change the way you react to the world. There's another anthropologist, Edward Hall, and he talks about this thing called tacit culture and explicit culture. So explicit culture is something that we're really good at identifying and codifying. So these mass generalizations like Canadians are polite. 
That's explicit culture. That's behavior that we've identified, and we know this is happening, and we categorize it under a term, Canada, in this case. There's this other thing called tacit culture. So when you go to a grocery store and you buy a bunch of stuff and then you want to check out, you typically would go to a counter and stand in line. Why do you stand in line? It's not like anyone ever told you to stand in line. But somehow you received all of these subtle cues and signals that informed you that the thing to do in this context is to stand in line until it's your turn to check out. That's what Edward Hall calls tacit culture. So the important thing here is that explicit culture and tacit culture work in the same way. It's the same mechanism that you're using to take in experiences around you and generate the way you react to the world, your behaviors that follow. But ex explicit culture is something that we identify and we label, whereas tacit culture is working in the same way, we're just not as aware that it's happening. And we're actually really good at identifying explicit culture. We take these uh, things that we, these patterns that we see and we identify them in a way that's much more codified than tacit culture. In fact, we all carry around all these little books that tie us to a geography, that tie us to a culture. These institutions that have bounded explicit culture. How did this concept really originate? So way, way, way back when, before we could travel, you only could really access ideas and people from your geographic sphere. So you can only really access people from around you. And so your ideas and uh, all the things that you were interested in could only really spread as far as your geographic boundary. And from that cultural influence, we formed these uh, concepts of geography, where your, your identity and you as a person, your culture is really tied to this geographic concept and that has become this institution where we carry on these passports and they define us to these geographic boundaries. But over the past couple of decades, things have been changing rather quickly. With the advent of digital technology and information spread, we no longer have to restrict our ideas to a geographic boundary. Things can spread across the world super quickly in a way they never could before. You have situations uh, where you have someone whose little passport, their geographic bound identity, might be really different from their cultural influences and the ideas and behaviors that they have. For example, you might have someone like me who grew up in Dubai in the UAE, who has an Indian passport now lives in America, and is now talking to you all in Canada. This is third culture kid syndrome. Your, your geography no longer really defines your cultural identity. You don't have to be from where you're from. And as a result of the ways people are operating with this ability to send ideas and thoughts really quickly around the world, we're seeing some really interesting things emerge. You now have people who have lifestyles in cities like San Francisco and New York, that are potentially a lot more similar to lifestyles in London or Tokyo than they are to Lancaster, South Carolina, or middle of nowhere, Mississauga. There is an article in uh, The Verge a while ago. It was written by this guy, Kyle Cheka, and he talks about this concept of airspace. So building on this idea where um, people in big cities have often similar lifestyles, he talks about how the aesthetic of these lifestyles kind of presents in a really interesting way. So you can go to an Airbnb in any major city in the world, and you'll probably find the same Nespresso machine, a very similar IKEA day bed. You could go to any coffee shop in any major city, and you could probably find the same bare Edison light bulbs, the same wooden surfaces, the same fancy cortado, the same latte art. And he calls this whole aesthetic airspace. It's this concept that you could be anywhere in the world and you could um, be in one of these mainstream places and you could find the same aesthetic. And this is sort of a, a comfortable, you know, you, you see this familiar stuff and he, he calls it the blanket of airspace. It's a concept of familiarity and comfortability, even though you're, in, you're, you're somewhere else in the world. Um, he, so he does into the reason that this happens. Um, so let's say you really like this coffee shop in San Francisco and you market 
you, you mark that you're interested in it, and you mark it really high on, on Yelp. Yelp then knows what you're into, and when you go to another part of the world, it suggests similar places to you. So the more you use these platforms, the more you feed these algorithms data on what you like, the more those things are going to be fed back to you when you go to different parts of the world. And so this, this platform is really what's spreading this aesthetic, and it's really what's spreading this, this form of cultural influence across all these various parts of the world and leading to this thing called airspace, where a lot of different parts of the world kind of look the same because they've been encouraged to be designed this way because that's what people have given the platform's feedback that they like. So that's airspace. But um, I had an experience that was sort of similar a few, few months ago. So I went to the middle of nowhere in North Carolina, a place called Brevard, which is a population of 7,000 people. And I'm originally from Dubai, UAE, which is a population of like 2 million people. So this was a new experience for me. And um, I met a family there, and uh, it was a Christmas Eve brunch type thing. And she offered me, I, I met my friend's aunt, Aunt Kelly, and she offered me dessert. And dessert was pretzel salad. And in case you're wondering, pretzel salad is made up of a layer of pretzels, a layer of whipped cream, a layer of jello, and a layer of strawberries. Pretzel salad. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, it is, it, it is, it's really something. So I, I had some pretzel salad, and I had this whole experience of small town North Carolina, and I got back to Charlotte, and I was dying to tell everyone about, you know, I can't believe they call this salad. This is so hilarious. This is a form of food. This is awesome. And strangely enough, when I told my friends in Charlotte this, who are from similar areas, they actually exposed me to a whole other category of gelatinous whipped cream salads. There's pretzel salad, apple salad, frozen fruit salad. There's this whole thing where you, you take these cans and you mix them together and you form a, a, a type of salad. And so I, I asked Aunt Kelly where she got the recipe for a pretzel salad. And it turns out she got it off a link on Pinterest. And this link was shared to her on Facebook by her friend in Minnesota. So... You have someone who forms this, this aesthetic, this concept of this food as a salad a dessert, and this idea is then spread to someone in a totally different part of the world or a totally different part of the country, and it spreads as cultural influence. This salad becomes a part of the culture of being in this place. And if you, if you go on Pinterest, you can actually search for you know, pretzel salad, and you find this whole page of similar salads, boards and boards and boards of things that are kind of arranged like this and put in these little glasses. And there's this whole form of aesthetic to this dessert. It's this thing that people are spreading all across uh, the U.S. in these, these various parts of the U.S. and potentially even all across the world because they now have access to doing that. So culture is no longer geography. Culture is no longer bounded to a specific geographic region. It spreads in a way that's much more about interests and information than it is about where you physically are at a particular point in time. So we've been talking about airspace and pretzel salad. And you might be wondering, what does this have to do with our jobs? Well, we are the ones creating Pinterest, Facebook, Airbnb. We are the ones creating the platform for a new kind of cultural influence. This new kind of cultural influence that's no longer just geographically bounded. We're creating these platforms that have all these new tacit cultural influences. We're not codifying them or identifying them as explicit cultural influences. They're working kind of behind the scenes to shape the ways people are thinking about the world, to shape people's behaviors, and shape people's experiences. This responsibility is huge. We're changing culture. And when you think about the way that we're approaching research and understanding people, 
If you think about the way that we're approaching this, typically from an ethnocentric perspective, this responsibility is really scary. We're changing people's lives in a way that we're perhaps not really fully understanding. We're perhaps not really fully diving into the ways people are using these products that we're making that are becoming this really deep part of culture. Culture is not geography because of digital technology. It's because of the stuff that we are making. And I think the potential pitfalls of this approach can really be seen when you look at the media consumption in the 2016 election. So the most recent studies show that 62% of Americans consumed their information through social media. And the lion's share of this information was consumed through Facebook. And the way Facebook works is you give it feedback and it gives you more stuff based on that feedback. So Aunt Kelly sees this post about pretzel salad and she likes it. And then Facebook is much more likely to, to send her more information that is similar to that. But not only can she like it, she can give it a set of six reactions based on what she thinks about this information. And that forms what she then sees on her newsfeed. This all is culture. All of these bits of information that she's feeding into it and getting back from it, all of this is cultural influence. And when you think about the 2016 election, a lot of us were pretty surprised, at least in the areas that I was in, a lot of us were pretty surprised at the result of the election. And a lot of us were, were surrounded by news feeds and information that wasn't quite reflective of the reality that we experienced. All of this stuff became culture. All of these bits of information we were taking in were feeding these cultural bubbles. And we don't really realize that that's happening as a result of the digital platforms that we're using. But, oops. I don't really realize what's happening as a result of my digital technology. So as, you know, UX, IA, UI, front end, whatever your job title is, ERS, all of us contributing to these platforms, we're all responsible for this influence. And we're taking this ethnocentric approach towards user research. We're, we're interpreting cultural relativism as trying to understand this person experiencing an experience through our lenses. But we fail to realize that cultural relativism, understanding cultural relativism, from someone else's perspective, is equally about understanding things from our own perspectives. We have to understand our own cultural bubbles before we can really understand someone else's. To put yourself in someone else's shoes, you have to first take off your own shoes. But to do that, you have to realize that you're actually wearing shoes. So it's not just about me understanding Steve's idea of Chipotle or Steve understanding my idea of Chipotle. It's equally about both of us understanding our own concepts of Mexican food and dinners and cheap food. It's not just about Walmart understanding Japanese customers' perceptions of everyday low prices. It's equally about Walmart understanding their own concepts of value and prices. And it's not just about me understanding this woman's concept of settings and notifications. It's equally about me figuring out why I think about settings and notifications and coupons the way I do. To understand someone else's cultural experiences and bubbles, we first need to dive into how our own bubbles are constructed in order to relate them to someone else's. We need to take these tacit cultural influences that we all go through and make them a little more explicit. But to do that can be kind of scary. In a lot of ways, your cultural bubble is kind of very wrapped up with your own identity. What makes you who you are? To question that really challenges your sense of self, potentially is a really scary place to go to. What makes you, you? Luckily, that's a really big question, and luckily we don't have to address it straight head on. There are a couple of frameworks that we can use to dive into uh, this question. They're anthropological frameworks, 
The first one is Hofstede's cultural dimension theory. So this guy, Geert Hofstede, came up with this in the mid, uh, mid 80s. He worked at IBM, did a lot of research across cult cross-cultural communications. So there are six aspects to this framework. The first one is the power distance index. So when you think about someone else's experience or your own experience, think of the power distance index refers to the specific aspect of thinking about power. So when you think about how high you are in an organization, how much do you see power as a vertical? There, there are lots of levels to reach the top versus how much do you see things as more flat? We're all kind of equals. Some people just have different roles and different responsibilities. That's one way that you can start to analyze or break down how you might be different from somewhere, someone else and start to quantify that. The second one is individualism versus collectivism. So how much do you see things as operating um, your, your own unit and you are operating in your own kind of uh, world versus you're operating as part of a group and you take a more collective approach towards making decisions. You are sort of a, a unit in a much bigger thing than just yourself. The next one is the uncertainty avoidance index. So how okay are you with not knowing about the future? Um, how comfortable are you with uncertainty? Do you, do you thrive in ambiguity or are you more okay? Uh, do you feel much more comfortable when things are very defined and things are not uncertain at all? The fourth one, so this was done in the late 80s um, and the title of this one is a little problematic to me. But it basically refers to um, assertion or not. So uh, masculinity refers to the qualities of being um, kind of taking charge and being more assertive versus femininity, femininity refers more to the qualities of listening and kind of um, assessing the environment of a room before really taking, taking decisions or, or approaching things. Um, the next one is long-term orientation versus short-term orientation. Um, so do you think more on a long-term scale or a short-term scale? And the last one in uh, Hofstede's cultural dimension theory is indulgence versus restraint. So how, how much do you kind of indulge in pleasures versus how much, are you, uh, how much more merit do you see in holding back? Um, so this is, this is Hofstede's cultural dimensions theory that he put together. Um, and there's a second one, back to Edward Hall, who talked about tacit and explicit culture, um, where he looked at these primary message systems. So these are a little more broad, and there are 10 tools to interpret human activity. Um, so again, when you're thinking about you and who makes, what makes you yourself versus how you can relate that to someone else, these are ways that you can start to slice that. Um, so these are, uh, I'll run through these really quickly. Their interaction, association, subsistence, bisexuality, territoriality, temporality, so how you think about time, learning and acquisition, how you acquire more knowledge, play, um, how, how playful is a culture, defense, um, and exploitation. Exploitation is exploitation of the environment around you, so how much do you take advantage of um, the earth and natural resources and so on and so forth. So again, in thinking about uh, ways to perceive and understand culture, these are, these are specific aspects that we can look at to try to understand how are we different from somewhere else, someone, someone else or how are we similar. Ultimately, when we design stuff, to design actions, we have to understand motivations. And to understand motivations, we have to dig into people's heads. And what connects us are the things that are similar, not the things that are, are different. So really building a bridge between someone else, to bridge that gap between you and an end user, you're really trying to figure out how your experiences really relate to this other person's experiences to figure out what their needs are and, and how you can understand that in their context and the culture um, that they are in. So there are tons, there are so many elements to culture. There are so many different lenses that you can apply. And these frameworks are just two ways of approaching this issue. And we're creating more and more cultural elements every day. These frameworks are a good place to start, but they're not really enough. The big concept here is how to take a more culturally relative perspective towards understanding someone else. There's a story I like. Um, it's called the Stone Soup Story. So there, um, there are these, these soldiers a long time ago. It's a folktale fable. There was this group of soldiers that was coming back from war, and uh, they arrive at this first village, hungry and tired, and it's late at night. And um, 
they knock on the first villager's door and ask them if they can have some food and a place to stay. And the villager goes, sorry, no, uh, there was a drought recently, so I can't give you anything. My resources are too precious. So then they go to the next door and they knock on the door and ask the same thing. And the person inside says, sorry, no, we can't give you anything. And they try again and again and again, and none of the villagers want to give them any food or any shelter. So the soldiers are not defeated. They go down to the river, they take a big pot, and they fill it up with water, and then they pick up a stone from the ground. They put this in the center of the town square, they put the stone inside, and they start to stir the pot and light a fire under it. So one villager comes out and goes, what are you doing? The soldier goes, we're making stone soup. It's delicious. But you know, it'd be really good with some carrots. The villager goes, oh, well, you know, there was a drought, but I've, I've got some carrots. So he brings out his carrots, and someone else comes by and goes, oh, what are you making? Stone soup, but it'd be really good with some potatoes. And the villager goes, yeah, I, I've got a few potatoes, and he brings out his potatoes. And slowly, more and more people start to bring the, the limited re resources that they have, and uh, the soldiers put it all in this pot, and everyone in the town eats this delicious meal, and the soldiers move on happy and no longer hungry. And as they pass by the next village, they bend down, they pick up another stone, and they enter the village. These soldiers were great cultural relativists. They were able to take what they were feeling and experiencing, and instead of being so tunneled into their needs and projecting those onto the villagers, they were able to understand what the villagers need and maximize all of the resources that they all had access to. I want to be like those soldiers. I want to make some delicious stone soup. I'm going to end with this quote that my yoga teacher sometimes says. As we come out of our very last shavasana, she says, we are constantly manifesting our thoughts into action to create our realities. Our realities are so subjective, so singular to every single person in this room. And as UX practitioners, our realities are working to create other people's realities. We are creating all of these little bits that go into culture. This responsibility is massive. In the digital age, where information moves fluidly between atoms and bits, it's kind of incredible. We have this amazing influence over so many people. But there's also so much more responsibility. There's so much stone soup to be made, but we have to make it right. Thank you.